Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's uh, time for another of these uh, live events. It's uh, great to be with you all again. Um, things have been busy for everybody, but uh, I think we have a really a great crew tonight. There's a lot to talk about in pediatrics and critical care. We'll be hearing from Peter W. Uh, we've got Arlene Claudius with us, plus the usual crew. But uh, before we begin, let me show uh, a few slides um, to set up the evening for us. And uh, I'll ask Stuart when you're seeing those. We are in email. Excellent. So uh, unfortunately, before we begin, um, I'm having technical issues, of course. Uh, I can't show it. So let me try this one more time, always with the technical issues with me. Um, the picture is not coming up, but I just want to talk about um, Lorna Breen. Um, many of you have heard about uh, Lorna in the last few days. She was a colleague from um, New York in emergency medicine. She worked really hard. She saw lots of COVID patients. She actually developed COVID-19, recovered, went back to work, but unfortunately a few days ago committed suicide. Uh, her father has been throughout the news um, talking about her. He wanted the world to know that uh, she was a hero. Uh, he's a retired surgeon himself. And it, her death sort of reminds us that this job is difficult at the best of times, um, but this is an extraordinarily difficult time. And it's just an additional stress on top of everything else. We don't know the details of her life, but we know that uh, what she did really mattered and what you're doing really matters. And uh, just remember that if you're feeling stressed, that's normal, go talk to somebody, reach out to your colleagues and your friends. This is, uh, this is a, a stressor on top of what is already a very stressful job. So um, in respect uh, for Lorna and, and her work, please uh, don't be afraid to go see somebody. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. And uh, to you, Lorna, for your years of service, uh, what you did really mattered, so thank you. So Stuart, I'll take over the screen again, because I think it was just that one slide that was the problem. Um, it's hard to transition after something like that, but we have to continue on. And uh, so the chapter is getting updated uh, still frequently. The, the rush of information has slowed down a little bit, but we are continuing to uh, revise and revise and to Salim, Razai and others that are helping us. It's been really helpful. We now have uh, versions in Spanish, French, Portuguese, soon in Arabic and in Japanese. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking um, uh, some pediatrics, uh, some critical care stuff uh, with Peter W who has some really fascinating information from New Orleans. More therapeutics updates. We wanna to talk to Kathy Garvin, a nurse at County with some really interesting stuff about nursing, but also uh, about living in downtown Merritt with lots of other healthcare workers. And I think a really important serology update from Dave Schreiger. So we've also been doing some public facing stuff and uh, I want to show a video that Jess put together about staying away from the emergency department, but not too much. I'm Dr. Jessica Mason, an emergency physician in California. We asked you to stay home and you did. Thank you. You have helped flatten the curve. Now we're worried about something else that we didn't expect. Where are all our patients with heart attacks, strokes, appendicitis, and all of the many other things that we usually help people with? A recent study showed a 38% drop in the number of patients coming in with heart attacks. We didn't cure heart attacks. You're just not coming in. While some hospitals are packed with COVID patients, others are empty. If you're having a cold or mild flu symptoms, stay home, call your doctor. For everything else, if you're worried that coming to the ER is a risk, not coming to the ER might be a bigger risk. I think that's a really important message. Um, we are concerned there's like a 38% reduction in MIs in some of the studies. And um, we think that it's probably just that people are staying home to have their heart attacks. 
there is the possibility that not getting a viral infection may reduce may reduce MIs because of inflammation or something, but I think it's most likely that it's just people aren't coming. So we'll put that out. If you want to share that widely with friends, relatives, whatever, I think that's a good idea. You know, last week I started a silly new thing, words that Stuart uses that you don't know. And uh, we should continue that this week because um, this one's a good one. Show it. In our ongoing series of words that Stuart knows that you don't, he said that he didn't want to be too Pollyanna about the situation. Pollyanna? Like more than one Anna? Like multiple Annas? Like, like lots of Annas? Well, it turns out that's not what it means. So I had to look it up, and apparently it's from a novel from 1913 about a girl that does the glad game, tries to find something glad and happy in every situation. Or it could be many Annas. I'm saying it's possible. It is possible. So let's uh, talk um, views from New York, New Jersey, New Orleans, and Fresno. So Swami, do you want to take this? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, you know, not much has changed actually since the last time you guys let me do an update from New York, New Jersey. Our numbers, overall numbers are way down. We are starting to see that uh, very low group number of patients that are coming into the hospital. We've, we've gone almost, I mean, backwards sounds like the wrong word to say, but we've gone from having 100% COVID penetrance, every single patient having COVID, to probably closer to maybe 60%, 60, maybe 65. And we're seeing a lot of our patients with other illnesses start to emerge again, a little bit of what Jess talked about earlier. And it's, it's kind of heartening to see that because we, we want those patients to be coming back in when they have problems. Um, but we're still nowhere near our usual volumes. And, and New York has had very similar experience. Now, the interesting thing is that while the emergency departments don't have a huge number of patients coming in, the overall hospital and the ICUs are still packed in New York, New Jersey. Those patients, they're not moving very quickly. They're staying in the units and in the hospital for a long period of time. So we're still very short on beds and we still have boarding issues. We have patients boarding with us for days at a time because there are no beds anywhere in the hospital for them to go to. We have open new units to put patients into, which has definitely helped, but we're still seeing a crowded emergency department, but not crowded with incoming patients, crowded with patients who just can't ever leave. So uh, we have definitely passed the initial surge, whether we'll see a second surge or not, who knows? It depends on how loose we become with our restrictions, uh, with our lockdown, with our stay at home. Um, I, I'm fortunate to have a governor who's pretty savvy in New Jersey. And I think New York is very similar. So we're really trying to be strict about not loosening those, those uh, uh, things that we have put in place to help. And hopefully that'll, that'll help. But um, like I said, the, the hospital itself, very full boarding for long periods of time. Jess, can you tell us uh, what's happening in Fresno? You never really got killed. Is that still the case? Yeah, there's really not a lot of new things happening since we talked about this last week. Um, we still don't have that many cases in the county. We have about 450 cases and we still have only seven deaths. And and when I go work a shift, I am still really not seeing very much COVID. Thank goodness. So I don't know if our if we're ever going to get this initial wave, if it's going to hit Fresno or if maybe, you know, I'm speculating, but maybe we won't see a surge of cases until the fall. You know, fortunately, Fresno is a part of California that gets really hot and early it gets hot. So we're already, our, our temperatures are already in the eighties and nineties. Maybe that's playing a role. Um, and just for some interesting perspective, I was reading an article about how Fresno responded to the Spanish flu of 1918 and the mayor a hundred years ago was also very proactive in shutting things down early and fast and it was very effective then, um, but then they ended up getting a second wave. So it still, who knows what will happen, but for now, not a lot has changed and the hospital is now looking to see when we can start reopening for elective surgery cases and trying to do that in a gradual and responsible fashion. One of the other sort of um, unexpected and sad effects of COVID in this part of the state is the furloughs that are happening at some hospitals. And we've seen that now in hospitals in Fresno where there's been well over a hundred hospital staff that have been furloughed at one of our hospitals locally. So um, hopefully things will, our patients will start coming back, not with COVID, but with the things that we're, you know, wanting to take care of them, we want to take care of everyone, but the, the things we, the usual stuff, the routine stuff. So hopefully those patients come back and we get back to normal soon. 
Thanks, Jess. I want to bring in uh, Peter W., a man who needs no introduction, so I won't give him one, but he's in uh, New Orleans and he's very important. Peter, tell us who you are, what you do, and what's happening there. So um, I'm the Chief Experience Officer for University Medical Center. My training's in emergency medicine and pulmonary critical care. Still practice in the ED and still do rounds in the ICU. Um, and so we're on the backside of the peak for COVID in New Orleans. Um, our resources were stressed mightily, never ran out of ventilators or ICU beds and never really had to have profound boarding in the emergency department. We currently have 10 patients in the ICU down from a high of 52. Um, we have at the max had about three quarters of our patients COVID and currently it's less than 25%. The mayor has strict um, guardrails up until mid-May and we'll, we're gonna start seeing um, more loosening of our surgical procedures here uh, beginning next week. Next week, we'll start to do that. Our knife and gun club has been busy for the last couple of um, days. And so our traumas are back up after being really incredibly quiet. The ED um, for a while there was seeing under 50%. So we had numbers that were less than Christmas day like activity. And then now it's um, not back to normal, but probably 75, 80% of normal. Um, so you have that to look forward to. Excellent. Um, we're gonna get back to Peter in a minute and talk about some of the really interesting things they are doing with intubation. It's really good to know that your gang members got the memo that it's okay to get back to usual activities. That's great. Um, I'm gonna to throw to Jess now, who's gonna be talking with Eileen about some really interesting PEDS stuff. Yep, so I get the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Eileen Claudius, who's an emergency physician and also boarded in pediatric emergency medicine. And Eileen, would you start by just sort of giving us what's the overall overview of how COVID affects the pediatric population? What are the key things that we need to know? You know, every time there's a critically ill kid, it makes the news and it should, it's tragic and it really scares people but there've only been three pediatric deaths in kids under 15 from COVID in the United States. And overall kids have been doing really, really well. Less than 2% of cases are in kids. They are rarely hospitalized. Infants do the worst. Older children obviously do better as happens with most of these illnesses. But even in that zero to four age group, the hospitalization rate is only 0.3%. It's not terribly high. So kids in general have done very well with this disease. Just like all children look better than their adult counterparts in reality, kids with COVID also tend to look better than their adult counterparts. Less fever, less sore throat, less cough, less fatigue. There are a few things in kids that I think are a little bit interesting and concerning. There are a number of children and the quoted percentages are anywhere between 11 and 42% who have absolutely no respiratory symptoms at all, but do have findings when you do chest CT. So that is something to be aware of. Co-infections are rampant in children up to 40% and kids will shed the virus if they get it in their stool for up to 30 days. Mm -hmm. So while they might be doing very well, they're busy infecting mm -hmm. us who may obviously not do quite as well. Okay. That's interesting to know. I didn't realize that they presented a bit differently. And in, in, since they're not typically presenting with respiratory symptoms, are there other symptoms that we should be looking out for in, in children? The symptoms are really overlapped with adults, obviously GI symptoms, very occasionally cardiac symptoms. So the same things that we're seeing in the adult population, children are just much more likely to be asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. Now, uh, we heard some case reports coming out about an association between COVID and Kawasaki disease. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yes, and I should, to be clear, say that we thought kids were doing great with this until last weekend because some really groundbreaking news came out. There was a report sent out over this weekend by the National Health Service in England, and I'm actually gonna read the report because I think it is really interesting and then I'd love to break it down and talk about it a little bit. So to quote, it says, over the last three weeks, there has been an apparent rise in the number of children of all ages presenting with multi-system inflammatory state 
requiring intensive care across London and other regions in the UK. These cases have common overlapping features of toxic shock syndrome and atypical Kawasaki disease with blood parameters consistent with severe COVID. And it goes on to talk about some of these children being COVID PCR positive, some of them having positive serology tests, and also a prominence of GI symptoms and cardiac symptoms as well in these children. So it sounds like there have been at least 12 kids in the UK who have required intensive care for this, one of whom has gone on ECMO. And since these reports came out, Italy is now saying, hey, you know, by the way, we're seeing a huge uptick in Kawasaki disease as well. There's one hospital in Italy who's reported 20 cases of Kawasaki disease over the last month, which is a six-fold increase over what they normally see in a given year. So there is something definitely going on. If I could have the slides up for a second. So this is the first article to come out on this. And this is a case report about a six-month-old child who presented with what looks like Kawasaki disease, probably due to or associated at least with COVID. This kid has the typical limb limbic sparing conjunctival injection, and they have a very typical Kawasaki disease rash that you can see on these pictures that are from the article itself. Now, could COVID be causing Kawasaki disease? Absolutely it could. I mean, we don't know what Kawasaki disease is actually from, so it certainly could be from COVID, a lot of things point to it being from an infectious trigger at least. And there are studies that show that up to 40-ish percent of kids will have a positive respiratory viral panel. And while it's not normally coronavirus, there have been a few studies on both sides proving and then showing otherwise that certain strains of coronavirus may be one of the more associated viruses with Kawasaki disease, particularly N63. So for those of us who don't see Kawasaki disease very often, could you remind us what we're looking for to make that diagnosis? You showed us the limbic sparing conjunctivitis and the rash. Give us a quick overview to, to help refresh our memories. Absolutely. Now remember, we are only dealing with 12 patients at this point, so we don't have a huge breadth of knowledge what this is going to look like. But in the UK's report, they talked about atypical Kawasaki. Now, first, to just kind of go over the criteria for typical Kawasaki, that's going to be five days of a fever. Of course, if it is a classic case, you can say, yes, I think it's Kawasaki on day three or four. You don't have to send the kid home and wait for day five to happen. But it's going to be five days of a fever associated with four out of five of the classic clinical findings. And that's going to be a rash. And it really can be any rash, but usually it looks a lot like what we saw in those pictures. A non-exudative conjunctivitis, usually bilateral, erythema and or swelling of the hands and feet, some type of mucous membrane changes. And the classic one that we always talk about is that strawberry tongue, but it can be something as simple as cracked lips. And the last one is cervical lymphadenopathy, and it needs to be a node greater than 1.5 centimeters. So those are the classic findings for typical Kawasaki. When we're talking about atypical, we're usually talking about kids who have only two or three of those findings. So they don't necessarily have four or five like we would see in a more classic case. And what can help us in diagnosing those kids are some of the labs that we've been seeing in these children coming out of the UK and that were cited in that case report. So these kids will have an elevated CRP or SED rate. They'll have anemia, a low albumin, an elevated ALT, elevated white blood cell count, a sterile pyuria, and if you wait long enough, elevated platelets as well. And so if it's a questionable case, sending some of those labs off can help guide you if you don't have easy access to things like echo, which are more definitive. Okay, great. That's helpful for the review. Um, and in terms of other things that you're seeing right now in the pediatric population, are there other trends that you're seeing that you know may or may not be related to the pandemic that we need to be aware of? Absolutely. Until this weekend, I was fairly certain that almost none of the morbidity and mortality from coronavirus was going to actually come from the virus itself, but rather from casualties of this safer at home, which I guarantee you most children who have not been in their parents' care 24 hours a day for months on end are not necessarily safer at home. I was driving the other day and passed by a family who was wearing their masks. They were riding bikes at night 
with no helmets, wearing black, and crossing the street illegally. That child is not gonna be injured by COVID. They're gonna be injured by somebody hitting them with their car. And I think that's a lot of what we are starting to see as patients are coming back into the ED are the sequelae of being at home. Friday, and you might remember that was sort of temporarily correlated with Trump's speech. The New York Poison Control Center got 30 calls in 18 hours regarding cleaning product ingestions. And there are people like me who don't typically spend a lot of time cleaning their bathroom with bleach, whose kids are now home, who are doing this, and we're seeing a lot of bleach ingestions. And one of the big issues with this is household bleach that you would put in your laundry is very dilute. It's like three to 5%. But when you use the more serious bleach cleaning products that people are using to clean their bathrooms, their kitchens, every surface in their house, now their children, maybe they're injecting it. I don't know what's going on now. These are actually very, very high in the pH. The actual pH of bleach is like 12.6. And so these are caustics and kids are coming in ingesting these much more concentrated forms of bleach containing products. And so we are gonna be seeing a lot more caustic ingestions in kids that if they're symptomatic are gonna to have to be admitted for endoscopy. Of course, I'm seeing lacerations, head traumas, things up the nose. But the other thing that I think we really need to be alert for is child abuse. Increase in domestic violence reporting, but a decrease in child abuse reporting. And one of the big reasons for this is that teachers account for about 25% of child abuse reports, as do I'm sure a lot of other people like pastors, rabbis, places that kids aren't going now. So we are really the only people that are there to pick up child abuse and to report it. And we are seeing decreases in child abuse reporting across the board at a time that kids are home all the time with their parents and domestic violence is going up. It doesn't make sense. So really we need to be on the alert for this in the ED and we need to be ready to report it if we see any signs of abuse because we're probably the only chance that that child's going to have. Those are really important points. Thanks, Eileen. Um, does anyone else before we move on have any questions about pediatrics for Eileen while we have her on the line? I've got one from the chat line and they want you to comment on the fact, do you think that the fact that kids are not getting it as much is because in the last few years, there's been some coronaviruses that look like the current coronavirus? Could that be an explanation why kids are not getting it? There's no clear explanation that's been really put out there. There's a lot of different explanations having to do with their lung parenchyma. Lots of different things are out there, nothing certain. If you want my personal opinion, I think it's exactly what you suggested, which is there are at least four benign-ish, benign strains of coronavirus, and kids have been getting those year after year after year after year. And just like when we get our flu shots year after year after year, we tend to get a less severe case. So I think that they are getting it so much less severely that they're not getting tested and it looks like they're really not getting it at all. Excellent. All right, let's uh, keep it moving then. And we're gonna get into the critical care stuff with Peter W in just a second. But before we begin, Sarah Craiger was over in the studio, physical distancing and doing all the right things and putting in the next of her series, Invent Management, which is outstanding and should be up on the site very soon. But we were just sort of chatting and testing cameras and I was just sort of caught her waxing philosophic about um, COVID-19. You know, like every critical care person in the country, she's thinking a lot about it constantly and seeing a lot of patients. So let's run the video and then Swami, you can take it from there. I really think that a lot of it is if you have the personnel resources who are not completely overwhelmed such that you can give individualized, personalized, just very thoughtful, careful, physiological, critical care, and you have the people with the knowledge to do it, and those people are not being completely, completely just slaughtered every day by the millions of patients since they have the bandwidth to do it, I think that is what gets the patients there. Like, I don't think that we know, there's not gonna be a magic bullet, there's just not. I mean, I think that it, if there's gonna be one thing, it's gonna be the combination of CPAP plus an inhaled pulmonary vasodilator before you intubate the patient, I think, although we'll see. Um, I think by the time you've intubated them, it's probably too late, but maybe if you do it before. Um, but, but, but I think that our numbers at UCLA are pretty good. I mean, we're, 
X to, I mean, we're better than 50%. Like, we'll see exactly what our numbers are, but I think it's because we, and we've had a couple people on ECMO and we've, every single person we've gotten off, but I think it's just because you just, I mean, it's like what the Gattinoni article said, like, just look at the patient in front of you and know enough to go off protocol and respond to whatever their physiology is telling you and be super vigilant and on top of it and just like pay expert attention to them all the time for like three weeks. And there's no shortcut, I don't think. And if you have the expertise and bandwidth to do that, then I think you can actually extubate a lot more of these patients. Peter, so it sounds like what what Sarah is saying is that what we need is kind of a, a callback to our basic critical care, good critical care management. And we were talking a little bit about this before. The numbers that you guys saw in New Orleans, the numbers out of Emory and out of Stony Brook that were recently published in the last two days are very different than the New York numbers. So what do you think is different? Do you think that Sarah is honing in on it? Or if you'd like, you can tell us what the magic bullet is. We trust you. And if you tell us that there's a magic bullet, we'll all start prescribing it. Well, there, there is a magic bullet, and that's just common, good, critical care sense. And so this is not rocket science from this perspective. Um, if you're overcrowded and you don't have the necessary resources, you don't have the manpower to decide who goes on a ventilator, how do you get off the ventilator, and how your drip should be titrated, then you're going to do poorly, and you're going to stay on the ventilator longer. Um, I think you know, not intubating early is probably a clever thing, whether you're using humidified high flow nasal cannula or CPAP or BiPAP is less the issue. Um, probably keeping them on the ventilator for shorter periods of time is the issue. We've had success rate with 40% of our patients being extubated and discharged home, not to a nursing home, home. And, you know, we had an average of 4.2 days on mechanical ventilation. Um, so those are lower numbers than have been reported. Um, and so we've had that luxury, um, but this was all kind of set up by a protocol by a guy who was at the bedside, um, tuned in and really, really paying attention to details much like Sarah espoused. It's, I mean, she's right on about that, but not all of us have that same degree of manpower and resources. And that's what makes it tough, I think. I think, Peter, again, we were talking about this beforehand, is a really important point that you brought up. When we got hit in New York and New Jersey, we really didn't have the three or four weeks building in, open up more units, get some more critical care folks ready to go, transition other critical care areas into medical critical care areas. We didn't do any of that. And so when the 200 patients came in the door and 100 of them needed critical care, we were immediately overwhelmed. What were your numbers like as far as boarding in the emergency department, ratios of nurse to patient, doc to patient. Was there a difference between the post-COVID surge and the pre-COVID surge? Um, there's a little bit of a difference, but not much. Um, the boarding in the ED, nothing really excessive for the critical care patients, maybe 12 hours max. And that was kind of rare. Um, we were able to turn our 24-bed trauma intensive care unit into a COVID unit in the space of two days. And so that met um, the capacity needs that we had. And then we stood up another 24 bed negative pressure unit um, in the space of a week. Um, our greater struggle was finding the appropriate nurses. We have the luxury of being between LSU and Tulane medical schools. So those experts were you know, busy at it, delivering the care, uh, but getting the appropriate nurses to the bedside was important. Um, we were able to convert those trauma patients over to the PACU or recovery unit and the burn unit. And so those teams were really instrumental in helping out with our typical patients, um, making room for you know, 52 plus um, COVID patients in the ICU you know, at our max. And now we're down to 10 COVID patients in our ICU. So a dramatic swing in the space of about six to eight weeks. Yeah, we still have 10 ICU patients in my emergency department right now that we're boarding still. So you talk about 12 hours. We were talking about eight to 10 or 12 days that patients were staying in the emergency department. And Peter, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It sounds like what you're saying, what Sarah's saying, what everybody in New York is trying to tell everybody else is ramp up now, open up more units, hire more people, 
get more nurses that are trained, that are cross-trained to take care of ICU patients, to take care of floor patients with this. And as much as we like to think we're all important, without the right nursing ratio, none of this works. Without nurses, without the right number of trained nurses, you can't do anything. I would agree with that 100%. I think that that's critically important. I'd also point to our listeners that boarding, whether you're a med surge patient or whether you're an ICU patient, portends worse outcomes. Um, so we're not doing our patients any favor. Now, I would tell you, I would rather be boarding in the ED than boarding on a med surge unit any day of the week both from a nursing perspective as well as physician perspective, I think you're better off. However, you're, it's still not the ideal situation. Peter, let's uh, uh, pop up this flow diagram that you shared with us that you guys are using. If we can get that slide up of Peter's critical care guidelines. Actually, and Stu, we can, can you look show at that. it? It's not working for me. In the meantime, while we're getting that up, one of the questions that came across on the chat, Peter, was about Heliox. If you guys have used this at all, if you have any experience or if it has any benefit or uh, if it's not something you've reached for. So I've had experience with Heliox in the past, but we're not really using it um, in these cases. Um, we, we've not really had the need to at this point. Um, the diagram that you see in front of you is one that was created by uh, an intensivist, pulmonary critical care intensivist, David Jans out of Vanderbilt, who's now with us. Um, and he's just absolutely brilliant. And it, it, it echoes back to what Sarah um, detailed before, which is just good basic critical care. So from a ventilatory standpoint, it's lung protective ventilation and using ARDSnet protocol and really driving on the high PEEP end of it. And again, prone positioning, um, we actually had a prone team, the anesthesia team, mobilize themselves and came through the ICU and would prone folks every day. Just that team focused on that, which allowed our intensivists to focus on intensive care medicine, not the mechanics of flipping people. And then fluid management, typically running patients on the dry end and basing that on your presser needs and use. And then from the sedation standpoint, again, you know, Society of Critical Care Medicine starting everything with fentanyl if it was available and then running the patients kind of on the lighter end so that they could participate in their care if that was possible, particularly if they weren't being flipped. Peter, a couple of things in here that I, I find really interesting that you've there's been a lot of conversation back and forth about one is about the fluids that uh, are being administered. These patients do have some insensible losses, right? High respiratory rates. They might've had some losses coming in, but it sounds like you guys are keeping them pretty dry. Yeah. You know, again, the ARDS net data supports dry patients. And so that really harkens back to that point, the insensible loss piece. I mean, even in asthmatics, it's not been really proven to be a reality. We, we think about it a lot. We talk about it even more than we think about it, probably, um, and we shouldn't be. And what about with the, the uh, uh, there's been a lot of looking at acute kidney injury with renal insufficiency. Do you think that us keeping them dry in the Lasix is contributing to this? This is something that was going to happen anyway. Where do you fall on that? I, I fall on that in, in, if you have enough inflammatory markers that are being released in the lung, you're going to wind up with a kidney hit. You're going to also wind up with the need to be on more than one presser in all likelihood. And that's the common pathway. Um, we, we kind of struggle with that set of patients because our nephrologists were, were hot and heavy to use um, renal replacement therapy that looked like CRRT um, as opposed to episodic hemodialysis. And their argument was, you know, hemodynamic stability. There, there's no real evidence that looks at CRRT being um, being a better outcome marker um, compared to normal hemodialysis. But CRRT, we found um, far more clotted lines and far more manpower issues. Um, it made it next to impossible uh, from a manpower nursing manpower um, standpoint to do CRRT. One last thing I wanted to get into, Peter, before we see if there's any questions from the audience is about proning. And you mentioned that you guys were doing some pretty aggressive proning on your intubated patients. I have a couple of images of some awake proning that we were doing down in the emergency department. Were you guys doing a fair amount of awake proning in the ICU or uh, was that going on elsewhere? Well, we did a little bit of that on the med surge units in the ICU. We really try to encourage our patients um, uh, to be up in a chair. Um, and do deep breathing. 
you know, this, the, the virus makes you pretty debilitated and pretty wimpy. And so these patients were just content to lay flat on the bed. And I think getting them up, um, getting them moving, getting them upright in a chair, having deep breathing um, is probably just as helpful as flipping them over. We were very aggressive in our place in the last two weeks about doing a, a awake proning in the emergency department. We didn't have really the manpower to do it on intubated patients, but on the awake patients. And what you see here is um, uh, the patient on screen left is a patient from uh, University of Maryland from Amel. Uh, you can see that they're on high flow nasal cannula and they've got them proned. Um, the patient on the right is one from my place. This guy came in with an oxygen saturation of 26%, which uh, we were talking about beforehand, shouldn't be compatible with life, but we've talked about that already. Respiratory rate of about 30, but speaking to us and flipped him and his sat went up to about 91% pretty quickly. And he's on a non rebreather. We haven't really been doing a lot of flipping with CPAP and we don't have any high flow nasal cannula available to us right now that all those machines are taken by patients that are in the unit. So we didn't have those, but this is just a non rebreather up to 91%. The prior picture patient was hundred percent on a non rebreather. Uh, so we we're seeing a lot of benefit from this. The little black pillow you see under there was something that Rich Levitan's brother actually sent us about half a dozen free to try out. And these were for our patients who had a little bit more abdominal girth because flipping a patient with abdominal girth can be a little bit tough. So I agree with you though, that it isn't just about the prone position. A lot of my patients wanted to sit in a chair at the bedside and we let them because they were very comfortable doing that. I almost feel like what we need is to take all those um, surgical, the post-op nurses and have them come down to the ED and yell at the patients to do the spirometer because <laughs> you never get atelectasis if you have a good post-op surgical nurse because they yell at you so much to do your incentive spirometer maybe that's the intervention is some incentive spirometry might help it just i think you're right taking the good deep breaths getting them moving around not lying flat on their back what uh what rich levitan calls the coffin position never a good thing we got to get them moving around left lateral d cube right lateral d cube in a chair these positions are really important peter i i completely agree with you i mean even walking around the room um because we're not setting these people free to, to roam the halls right but walking around the rooms things that they should be doing um, that has, you know, reduced the risk for clot has also increased their vital capacity breasts, uh, all a good way. I I'm not here to hate on proning. Um, I'm, I'm just here to say, I'm not so sure what the evidence is and whether you get the bang for the buck. Yeah. I think the only real evidence in the COVID time period is, uh, paper that came out by Nick Caputo, uh, Ruben Strayer, and Rich Levitan just about two days ago in Annals. But even they'll tell you, it's, a, it's not evidence. It is an anecdote of their experience. It's a series of patients. We'll have to see if more comes out. Um, any other questions from the chat? Otherwise, I'm going to throw it back to Mel. Yeah, there's a couple of questions from the chat. First of all, what is your extubation rate, Peter? Um, in China, they were, and this is basically asking what's the mortality. In China, if you got tubed, there was 80, 90% mortality in New York it was very high. Um, what was yours? So our mortality was 55%. Um, and again, we discharged home 40%, 40% of those patients who were intubated, right? We still have some folks in the hospital and we still have some folks who are currently intubated. So those are our current numbers. And you said before we were talking that an average of four days on the vent? Our 4.2 days are the duration of our vent days. We were very, very aggressive in moving patients off of the vent, doing spontaneous breathing trials three and four times a day um, to see if we could hit it and then placing them on non-invasive. So late to intubate, early to extubate was Correct. the regimen you use. Because we, we think the ventilator and the time on the ventilator worsens their ARDS, worsens those inflammatory markers, um, makes it more difficult for the patients. And you don't have like a young, healthy population. You have um, a population that probably has a lot of other disease, a lot of obesity. So this is not like it was a, a weirdly well group. Well, I, I would tell you that the, the first groups that populated our ICUs were a little bit younger, maybe average age um, 50s, um, but all of them, all of them were BMI boosted, um, every single last one of them. And it was difficult in prone positioning to tell who was who um, in the unit. And then that was the, the black people were then replaced um, by the brown people. And so we in New Orleans 
really had strong representation of social determinants of health. And so those people who normally were, were dying prematurely with heart disease, normally dying prematurely with stroke, normally dying prematurely with kidney disease were, were the patients who were dying um, with us um, due to COVID. One last quick question, because it keeps coming up. Um, prophylactic anticoagulation, did you, what did you do? There's lots of this microthrombi, there's lots yeah. of stroke stuff. Did you anticoagulate everybody? What'd you do? So it's interesting, um, in our MICU, who had the best stats um, with David Jan's group, um, no anticoagulation other than low dose, um, low molecular weight heparin. The TICU, probably a week into it, fully anticoagulated uh, patients on heparin. Um, and we really haven't diced down um, the outcomes for those two groups. There's uh, more questions and maybe we can get to them later, but uh, let's keep it moving. Thanks, uh, Peter. I, you might have to jump off because you've been in the hospital, I think you said for 42 days straight, which is <laughs> seems to be too much time in the hospital. <laughs> a little bit much. It's, and just reminding your listeners that, you know, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint and to engage in self-care. But um, I had this past weekend off, so I'm strong. But thank you guys. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Thanks, Peter. Peter. All right, guys. Be well. So I'm going to hand it off to Swad with some therapeutics update with Dr. Nort. All righty. Um, just wait for me to... All that work for this slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to bring Sean into the discussion. Um, and uh, let's start off with this one. Um, well, uh, the FDA, if you hadn't heard, has uh, cautioned against the use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine outside of a uh, study situation. So that's a big, big deal. Um, just my two cents uh, about this before uh, we get Sean's is, uh, you know, there's been no randomized controlled data published uh, that's peer reviewed. And um, although we saw that huge increase in mortality, uh, in the one study, the VA study with the 300 and some odd patients, I think it's, I think we should still be cautious to make the conclusion and remind ourselves that that also is an association, uh, the one with mortality. It's not good. It's not looking good. Uh, but we just have to be careful until we get, you know, the full data. So that, that's my two cents. What would you say, Sean? Yeah, I agree with you, Stuart. I mean, if we look at this, uh, we, there is, uh, we can't say causation, right? There's an association, exactly what you're saying, but things aren't looking so good for this drug and really should not be used outside of a clinical trial. You know, uh, you and I were discussing earlier, but this harkens back to the CAST study. If you're of a certain age, you remember the CAST study. It was an antidysrhythmic study from 1991, and a lot of people died from getting this uh, from antidysrhythmics. These were people who were relatively healthy, just had PVCs after MIs, and there was a couple of things, and I think this might fall into 20 years later. We might be talking about this the same way. We might be doing a lot. More yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, we were. I was going to say that. You know, there's, there's. It's not right now. Is not probably the time, but there's going to be a lot to discuss uh, in retrospect here because of what happened, uh, the massive, massive amounts of medications that were. Uh, distributed and redistributed and and, uh, and, and the public uh, that you know you saw the prescriptions went through the roof was some yeah. you know, tremendous amount of prescriptions uh, uh, but yeah uh, but I so think that's the update on hydroxychloroquine we're gonna have to talk about that so that's the uh, so not looking great <laughs> is how I summarize that um, so just to run down the list I mean it's funny we've been we've we've featured a lot of medications over the past few weeks the IL-6 inhibitors we were encouraged about them because they seem to be rather specific in their mechanism but uh, so far doesn't the data well not I, good, right? I, I I still am for tocilizumab so this is uh, cerulimab and the company to their credit, it actually released data, negative data that came out. Uh, uh, this was just the other day. So they had 457 patients that were uh, not on a vent, but they were severely ill. Uh, and it showed that while it did decrease their CRP was their marker, there was really no clinical benefit to that. Uh, you know, we're gonna be a little down on a lot of drugs, but just like you heard uh, Peter and Sarah talking, you know, once we understand these drugs, we're going to target them right for certain patients. It's just, this is kind of a broad swath that you're going. So don't get too depressed out there. I mean, this <laughs> is just the way the sausage is made, really, when you look at how drugs these are, are, are made like this. But uh, 
put this one in the column of not so hot though for IL-6 receptors. Yeah, so we're so we're waiting there. Um, the uh, remdesivir is it's that's the one that we write the novel about. I think yeah, as interesting <laughs> as a hydroxychloroquine was, the story behind remdesivir. Remember, that's the one where we had the the uh, leak of the audio from that uh, investigator at University of Chicago uh, that looked positive, but then you know uh, subsequently another, there's been. And another leak this week, the WHO inadvertently posted some pre-published data of 237, of which 158 were in the remdesivir group and the other 70 control and showed that there was no benefit. Now this was taken down from the website, but not before some- We have uh, the evidence. We have the evidence. It's, it's, in the, it's in the form of exhibit A, it's coming up. So, so show we'll show that. people that. So, so that was sort of that, so that, you know, the stock went up and then that the data came out, but apparently it's not great. So we're still we'll, waiting we'll to see it. To but, see. We'll have to wait for the studies, but so far not looking so hot. If it was great, we would have known about it, I think. Anyway, convalescent plasma, we don't have anything to report data-wise, uh, but there's no reason to be down on that. Uh, we're just waiting for data. Um, hey. Anything to add to that? No, just if you have patients that are recovered that meet the criteria, encourage them to go because uh, they need, we all need blood anyway for other reasons, but uh, yeah. we should start uh, just recruiting more and more patients for those convalescent plasma. That's a good point. That's a good point. And remember Mike Katz's story about his patient that recovered uh, that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, famotidine has been all over, all over the news. Myself, I went out and bought, uh, you know, some, <laughs> Did you, yeah. several, well, listen, I have suffered from heartburn for a long time, so I'm justified, right? But uh, of course, we're talking about famotidine in huge IV doses, and uh, it's gotten a lot of CNN and MSNBC coverage. And all that well, stuff. it did. And I give credit to the investigators out at Northwell, uh, Northwell out there in New York, because they really kept this under wraps, probably knowing that there was going to be a run on famotidine once this came out. But this is interesting. There's an ID doc named uh, Mike Callahan, who was out in China and just realized that, hey, there was a bunch of patients that should have otherwise died uh, that survived. And they look at them, it was over like 6,000 patients and identified that they were on famotidine. And they actually had seemed to be better. There was a mortality benefit of something like 14% to 27%, I think is what that prelim stuff showed. And that's really what drove this. This is a proper study and we'll just have to wait. But of course, we're not encouraging people to run out and pay a high dose uh, famotidine. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like maybe that you know they got it right in terms of the way that they kept things under wraps. So that's 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 important. Um, so uh, let's do, let's go on to uh, the uh, the the drug of the of the week. By the way, that's the that's Exhibit A. That's the 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 illicit screenshot uh, that showed that remdesivir. As you can see, everyone there, I circled it. It's uh, was negative. Uh, 237 patients. So we'll we'll hear more about that when it comes back up on uh, the site in a different form. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, our attempt to try to to prove that we understand these things, uh, uh, like like the real scientist. Uh, colchicine is our drug of the week, and actually, this came to a uh, Swami uh, in Jersey at his place. Uh, they're studying this. They have an active protocol there. So what? Now, th th one more thing. When I when I first heard about colchicine, and I was gonna suggest that Sean and I talk about it. I was initially uh, wary because it's one of those trigger drugs for toxicologists. It's a trigger, trigger drug because it's like, oh, that's the worst stuff. You know, they always want to say that's the worst stuff ever. You take that, there's nothing we can do from, you know, ECMO, forget about it. It wrecks the cells. And, and so I'm thinking that you were going to freak out, but we're not actually using colchicine in this case for um, its, uh, its role in arresting mitosis. Uh, it's actually for an immunomodulatory reason. I had no idea about this. Explain it to us. Well, that's that's what the thought is. So yeah, we, this is this study. It's called the Col Corona study. It's actually out of your home country, out of Quebec is where the PEI is. And this study's been uh, been going on and they've been actually doing it in Greece too. Uh, you are right. You could not pick two more dangerous drugs than chloroquine and colchicine uh, to, to study. It's like, what, what's next? I mean, it's going to be arsenic Cyanide. and lead, but in any event, uh, so if you look at this, you're right, but remember it's have those anti-mitotic properties, but, uh, just looking at this diagram that we made, what it does is you see, we have the colchicine there and look at the right half of this. So this is inside the cytoplasm and there's that thing called the inflammasome. And that's just this kind of a whole bunch of, uh, cascade effects that happens. And what that does is it, then uh, goes down and you see where that space is, it's the enzyme that converts the 
two interleukins to interleukins. And then you get a bunch of interleukins released. If you prevent that by the colchicine, by inhibiting that inflammasome, that's one. And then also where it says P2X7, that's what starts this whole signal transduction. And colchicine seems to work there too. So that's the immune modulary. Uh, modulating effects. Now, people had asked us a couple of weeks about melatonin and look. Uh, I'm like, I, like Sean, I'm looking at this diagram. One thing is the most toxic substance you say known to man. And then I see there's another pathway with melatonin, which most emergency doctors take for breakfast. And I'm right. like, well, why not just go, why not try out the melatonin first? But they are, they are also checking out the melatonin. Well, they are. So this is being properly studied and they are, I will say uh, to the investigators credit, these are all being used at therapeutic dosages. So they're not using very high dosages, but the melatonin, and again, we talk about this every week, sorry to repeat ourselves, but I mean, just diagrams, and this is really just people sitting around a table saying, hey, could these work? Trying to apply it, right? We have to be really careful how we this, but the melatonin does inhibit the uh, formation of the pro interleukins. The downside maybe for both of these is this is not specific. And that's why I like, or, or at least I like the IL-6 receptor antagonists that they're more specific than that. Yeah, that was the other thing was that uh, the, that category of drugs and also the, uh, the Jack um, yeah, uh, so inhibitors. Could, could yeah. you know, things can go either way with those. Don't forget, you know, you might unleash uh, uh, a good storm or a bad storm. You might also suppress the immune system when you're dealing with these uh, agents. It could go either way. So um, that's, the, that, that's the rundown. So still some reason to be uh, encouraged about a few of the things on the list still. We're crossing some off. We're adding some things on, and we'll keep on top of that. Uh, I do have a couple of good questions uh, from the audience. There's this persistent uh, business, uh, Sean, about the ACE inhibitors, yep. the ARBs, the patients that are on them. What's the latest from a, from a, a phar pharmacy point of view? So I'll tell you what the, the latest is. So of course, everybody, the initial concerns were if these patients are on this, they're going to update this ACE2 receptor and they'll have worse disease. So that was a concern. But then people said, well, if they've block these receptors, maybe they'll be beneficial. So it's being studied for that. The most recent data looks like it is no more dangerous. And there was just in circulation research three days ago, four days ago, a case series of 19 patients that actually did better. But we have to be really careful. So at this stage, ACE ARBs don't seem to be any more dangerous than people who aren't on them. Don't take people off. But it's too soon to say that they can be used for therapeutic benefit. All right, that's good. I got a couple more here. Now, uh, the toxilizumab and the ivermectin we've already discussed. I don't think there's anything really new to update right. on that. Um, but there are a lot of people asking about uh, Montelukast, right. uh, which of course we use for asthma prophylaxis. Anything about that? Yeah, so these are all being studied. They're similar, right? We were gonna talk about interferon too, but then everything just keeps coming and kind of climbs up the list. Uh, but they're all being studied. They're all these immune modulators. I don't have anything really specific. There's just ongoing trials and we really have to. And this is going to be, I know it's hard and you hear all these stories from like Peter W and Swami and everybody else, uh, how bad it's been, but hopefully there's no second phase. But if there's a second phase by this time, we're gonna have a lot of data that we can really interpret and maybe approach this in a much more scientific fashion. All right, so uh, that's the therapeutics update for this week. We're gonna we're gonna actually talk a little bit about uh, the nursing perspective next, uh, right, Mel? Yeah. So um, we haven't actually been uh, heard from our nurses much, except from the doctors saying this doesn't work if we don't have trained nurses, and um, it's a real issue that you run out of nurses very quickly when you fill up your ICU. But I wanted to get Kathy Garvin to come in and talk to us. Uh, she's actually working tonight. She's got two parts to this story. One is what they did at USC to get ready some very interesting stuff. And then the second part is of what's it like to live in a giant merit with millions of healthcare workers. So let's roll the tape. I think the nurses at first were super, super worried, super afraid, but kind of proud that it was them and weren't sure what was gonna happen. And now I think that they take a lot of pride they're doing an incredible job. They're picking teams that work together and signing up to go into our more difficult areas, kind of our COVID castle, we're calling it. And the what they're doing is 
we have separate areas. We have the patients that we initially suspect to have COVID, and then we have the patients that catch us by surprise. The patients that we initially suspect are going into an area that we have made into a negative pressure area with 14 beds. And then we have overflow areas as well. When they go into those areas, they are, they Don, we have somebody that they're calling a doffer. They've made up all their own names. They call him a doffer that watches to make sure they don and doff correctly. And they go in, they do four hour shifts and they're in there the whole time. They leave on their PPEs unless they're in a high risk situation. They take off gloves, they wash in between each patient. But other than that, they leave on their gowns, they leave on their shields or their headgear. They leave on their masks. If they're in with a high risk patient, then they doff everything in between. If they're doing aerosolizing procedures at all, then they take everything off before they go to the next patient. But it makes it a lot easier. It saves the PPEs. They just can go patient to patient, wash their hands, new gloves, move on. If it's, it catches them by surprise, it's still, it's still hard because they have to don and doff in between each patient and each individual time going into the room because they're with other patients as well. So it makes it tough, and that's a lot more nerve-wracking for them, a lot scarier. But when they're in the kind of COVID area, they're on a roll. They know they've got their four-hour shift. We have food and drink waiting for them. They take a lot of pride, and they do it really well. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So go to the bathroom, drink a liter of water, and then go work for four hours. <laughs> and then hold it for four hours. That's actually the, that's actually the biggest problem that they say is that having to go in. And I've spent, I don't think I've spent a full four hours. I've spent about three, three and a half hours in there. And once you get, it's very claustrophobic when you first go in, but if you're taking care of patients, it's not so bad. Once you have patients in front of you, you have something to concentrate on, you can do it for the four. So another thing that's uh, fascinating to me is that there's this giant Marriott. It's in downtown LA. It's part of LA Live, which is this big sort of entertainment uh, complex thing. And you've been staying there? Yes. What is going on? <laughs> it's actually started, it's hotels for heroes or something they call it, and frontline, rooms for frontline. There's all kinds of hotels in LA and I think across the country that have really said, we have no business. We're going to open it up to, they're opening up to EMS, they're opening up to docs, to nurses, and anyone actually, they've actually opened some of the hotels to the nursing attendants and to anyone else working on the front lines for free for a month. And so a <laughs> bunch of my nurses, and then shockingly, once the docs found out my nurses were all staying in one hotel, shockingly. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, but there's, uh, it's, it's very nice. It's a couple minutes from the hospital and little strange to see all the neon lights of downtown LA and, and nobody on the streets and yet all the nurses can go. So it's, it's a very kind thing to have done. That way, people that are worried about their families, because a lot of people are leaving, and we still have a lot of people bunking at each other's houses so that they don't have to go home. But a lot of people stay. I'm quite sure a lot goes on after I go to bed, but, <laughs> but it, it's nice. You don't have to worry about anything else. You just go crash. Well, that was going to be my question is why will people stay there? But um that's obvious, you know, if you've got grandma living at home, you don't want to go home, maybe even just husband, kids, wife, whatever. Um, it, it creates this opportunity for you to work, to still do your stuff, but not get killed by having to, you know, get an Airbnb somewhere. Exactly. And it's so close. Almost everybody's picking up, not that we actually have to in California, we don't have to pick up extra shifts, but with that fear that we did, that was another incentive, is that we just live close, we can sleep, work, sleep, work, and we're being fed like, like kings at the hospital. The community is donating so many incredible meals from all the restaurants downtown. So it's, it's been, we've been very spoiled. Yeah, we've talked a lot about on the show, uh, we look at New York that it exploded, it's completely out of control. California, we've shut it down really well, which is great because I retired four years ago. You do not want me coming back and doing a shift. <laughs> you don't want that. Actually, we do, but that's okay. Yeah, no, it's it's been very different. The hospital is, it's been picking back up. It's been picking back up with non-COVID patients even, quite a few in the last week. So we had a surge for a couple of weeks, kind of a downtrend for two weeks, and this past week it started picking up again with all kinds of patients. And 
So we really don't know what to expect. I think, as Jess was saying last week, it's really the, the patients have listened too well. They all stayed home. And so this is going to drag on. And thank God we're not going to get anything like New York, but hopefully it buys us the time to, to really learn what it is we need to do with this virus and to do it better. Each week we kind of change. We all listen in, we all read, and then it kind of molds itself each week. And so hopefully we've got enough time to figure this out. So uh, lots of countries watch the show um, that haven't had much of a surge yet. Um, got any advice for the nurses and the nurse educators for places where this isn't there but is coming? My advice would be to practice, practice, practice as far as the, the donning, doffing, and imagining, looking at your area and imagining how you could re-engineer it to provide Area, whole areas that you could kind of make negative pressure and shut off. I think that made the biggest difference for us as we kind of re-engineered everything. We moved our waiting rooms to different areas. We taped things off where people could sit, not sit. We have engineered two different areas that are straight negative pressure, um, maybe not as much as a circulating room, but that we are, are enclosed. We have air scrubbers and we can cohort the patients and that's made a big difference for PPEs, for nurse and doc sanity, for working the teams, and then planning on shorter shifts. That, that's really helped. So thanks to Kathy for putting that together for us. Um, I wanna now talk uh, lastly about um, serology and what's going on there. Let me share with you a couple of slides because this is really important for us getting back to um, some form of normality, although I don't think that's gonna be up for a while, but we now have the, some New York data. This was from last week, 21% uh, of New Yorkers are positive and uh, a little bit less than some of the other places. I did hear that they were, they've done another 8,000 patients, random sample, and it looks like it could be as high as 27% in some areas. And that sounds good, but let me give you the bad news. And the bad news is this, um, you do not have herd immunity, which means you know, enough people have it, so it's not gonna continue to spread. If you have an R naught in the sort of five-ish range, which we think maybe COVID is in that range, you need to have about 75, 80% of people. So we, even New York, which got absolutely crushed, still um, there's not enough people there for you to just say, yeah, okay, it's done, go back to work. It's not even close. So uh, I wanna show you, um, Dave Schreiger put together something that I think is really powerful, the best explanation of R0 and RT and what all that means. And uh, let's show that now. Well, um, again, let me echo what Mel has been saying many times, which is I have the utmost respect for everybody who's out there on the front lines uh, fighting this pandemic and uh, be safe and take good care of yourselves, your families and your patients. Um, we've been talking a little bit over the last couple of weeks about the epidemiology of, the, of COVID. And uh, I wanted to continue today um, trying to figure out where we're going to go from here and also review to some extent some of the terms you've been hearing like R0 and RT and herd immunity, uh, just to give you another uh, way of looking at these things. Um, for many, this may be review or obvious, but there may be a few of you out there who find this helpful. So we'll give it a go. So first of all, uh, this slide depicts 100 people who are vulnerable to getting COVID and one person who currently has it. What does this term R0 mean? The term R0 is specific to a, a certain environment, a place and a time even, um, and says, left to its own devices, how many people will get infected from this one person? So of all these people that this person contacts, how many of them will get infected? That's all R0 means. Recognize that R0 can differ from environment to environment based on how densely populated an environment is and other environmental factors that we don't fully know about yet. Temperature, humidity, all kinds of other things. So um, that's what R0 means. And as an example, uh, here's an R0 of 10. Over the course of this person's disease, um, they're going to infect 10 people, represented by the 10 dots here. If that happens, the number of cases will increase linearly on a logarithmic scale. And this makes sense if you think about it. The first person infects 10 people. Each of these infects 10 people. So that's 10 times 10 is 100. 
then those 100 people and if each infect 10 people, that's 1,000. And over this time period, whatever that transmission cycle is for this particular disease, we go up like that. If, however, we have an R0 of two, this one person only infects two people. And consequently, the slope, again, on a logarithmic curve is much lower. Finally, you can imagine that if R0 equals one, each person infects one person. I didn't draw the graph here, but you can imagine that there would always be a flat number of people, because as soon as this person has it, this person gets it. Eventually, this person doesn't have it anymore. This person still has it. So there's only one person who has it uh, in the community, and the disease would just kind of peter on. Three is a common number kicked around for this actual COVID infection, and that's what that would look like. But what we'd really like to know is not just R0, but what RT is. RT is what the actual transmission rate is in the community at a certain time. And just because R0 is three, RT doesn't have to be three. For example, imagine we do something which is the opposite of social distancing. We make, make everyone go to political rallies every day, which brings this infected person in much more contact with all the other people. And therefore, instead of infecting three people, this person infects this many people. And obviously, RT is much higher than R0 because, you, you, in fact, you've done social concentrating. Alternatively, um, you could do things like a six-foot rule or a mask, which would decrease this person's transmission. And even though the R0 is three, in the presence of these things, R0 becomes two. Ideally, for healthcare workers like ourselves, good PPE practices would set up a barrier that gets RT to be zero, even though R0 is three, and that no healthcare workers get infected. And clearly, that is our goal, not currently an achievable one, but hopefully something we can move towards with uh, better training, better availability of PPE, and less of a surge condition. If we try to stay at home, what does that effectively do? It decreases the number of people that this person is exposed to. So instead of being exposed to say 100 people in their normal life, they're only exposed here to 30, and instead of three people out of that 100 getting it, one gets it. If we combine all these things, the six, six foot rule, the mask, the stay at home, hopefully we could drive RT to less than one. When RT is less than one, each person is giving it, each person is giving it to less than one person on average, and therefore over time, the disease should disappear. And depending on how much lower than it is in one, it's a, it, it dictates how long it takes for the disease to disappear. So all of these types of techniques can take a disease that has an inherent R0 of three and drive it below one. So if we want to get rid of this epidemic, one way to do it is by techniques that decrease RT below R0. The other possibility is that R0 actually might change. So imagine that miraculously, uh, as summer approaches, as happens for many other diseases like the flu, R0 changes. Well, obviously R0 dropping down to one with the other social distancing things in place would drop RT to less than one and we would see the disease decline in the population. But let's now start off with an R0 of three. And let's assume now that um, we've been through this first cycle, the surge is over, the biology of the disease hasn't changed. R0 is still three. Uh, what happens next? Well, if miraculously everybody already had the disease and everybody was immune, and that could be by everyone getting it or by a vaccine, which we don't yet have, R0 could still be three, but RT would be zero in this case. If, on the other hand, we imagine that 20% are as immune, a number that's been kicked around as a high end estimate in New York. Well, these 20 people are immune, that kind of takes them out of it. But even with an R0 of three, you're gonna still have, just by the mathematics of this, assuming that everyone is equal, equal everyone who's susceptible is equally likely to get infected, um, you're still gonna have an RT of 2.x and the disease will continue to grow in the community. And these numbers, of course, this is what forecasters spend their lives doing is trying to figure out what that X is. For our purposes, just recognize it with this many people out, you still have transmission, which is above the magic number of one, and the disease will continue to grow. 
And imagine that in places not like New York, most of the rest of the country, this isn't anywhere near 20%. It's more like, you know, a couple percent, so that there are only five or six green dots, and the rest of these are all white. We're basically right back where we started from. So I think that was a really sort of nice overview of trying to understand this. And um, I'm hoping that some people in government understand this. Uh, after we've gone through all of this, we're still at this place where this can explode and be worse than before if we don't do the things that we've been doing. Now, Dave and I went on to discuss a lot more about what Sweden is doing, which did much less of this. And they said, well, we're kind of going to let this run through the community and try and get herd immunity that way and see what happens. Currently, they have tenfold the death rate of the other Scandinavian countries around them. Ultimately, those other countries might catch up and maybe Sweden was right. He also talks a lot about um, the fact that in an American system, and a lot of people outside the US don't understand this, in a for-profit system in the United States that runs a capacity because that's how you make money, there is no surge capacity. Whereas in other countries, there is surge capacity and there's more uh, distribution of hospitals in the right places. You can get away with a little less of the stuff that we're gonna have to do and are doing. So that's up on uh, YouTube now, you can go and listen to that. It's a really, really interesting conversation. So I wanna wrap this up now. Um, first of all, I wanna tell you that we are having a Spanish uh, live version again tomorrow with people from across the Spanish speaking world. Uh, Sarah Krager is also gonna be in there and Greg Moran who will both speak great Spanish. So if you uh, wanna hear some more from those experts in Spanish, you can do it tomorrow. We're actually gonna take next week off because like you, we have been sprinting. The crew has been sprinting, the faculty have been sprinting for two months and we need a mental health break. So we're gonna specifically take off next week unless something major happens like some of these randomized trials come out, in which case we might do a, a smaller version. I just wanted to thank all the faculty, all of the crew behind the scenes. We're gonna shut the video down now, but we're gonna, some of us are gonna hop onto the chat and we're gonna keep that going for a while because I know that there's always many more questions than we got to. So be safe out there, don and doff correctly, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right, thanks everybody.